sit back and relax and enjoy the show Watch me hit him with this one, two, knock out KO This time it's all or nothing and I ain't playing around They tried to overlook me cause I wasn't in they in crowd Well I'm back at it, so you know what's going down And I'm all up in they face so they gotta see me now With that raw lung what is up everybody welcome to the show it is five star fridays we are excited to be here tony is on the road at anime con this weekend i miss him dearly but i know he's going to be having a ball out there hanging out with shaggy having a big old time slinging books getting five star out there in front of new eyes new hot little hands to get on it it's all good. I've been having an amazing week. I hope you have too. Fee, how has your week been? It's been pretty good. It flew by pretty fast. Can't complain, but um, we made it to the weekend. And, you know, there's going to be a solar eclipse on Monday. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. We're getting total eclipse down here, man. It is nuts. Everything is booked up. They're closing down half of the roads in the city. I don't know how nobody's getting nowhere. It's going to be chaos. I'm putting my little glasses on and walking out the front yard. That's what I'm on. Uh, don't How stare doing, directly Ryan? at it. <laughs> I'm well. I, I did not have a, a fast week like me, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but I'm doing really, really, really oh. well. Yeah, getting ready. It just hit me this is Friday. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's Friday. I should yeah. know that because it's Five Star Fridays. It literally just hit me that Happy this is right. Happy Friday, Uncle Fishy. Yeah, this week is going by too fast. It's 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 it's, a, it's okay. We getting ready for Urban NerdCon and just mm -hmm. getting through it. Go have a blast. Getting through it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it's exciting. Sure. I can't wait to get to hang out in person again at Urban NerdCon. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Yeah, it's gonna be it. great. Journey to Ikea drop. Some books are going out. So it I'm looks beautiful. Here. I'm excited. So, mm -hmm. You did your thing as you always do. Absolutely. And this week, since Tony's gone, we've got a guest on with us this week. Let's bring on. We have got Mr. Tom Selinski. Welcome, sir. How are you? Hello there. Thank you for having me. I'm very well. Oh, okay. good deal. Glad to have you on the show, man. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I am a writer, a podcaster, a corporate coach, sometime improviser, uh, and uh, the, the uh, end of uh, 2021, it occurred to me to wonder how much Star Trek I'd watched. Uh, and so uh, that led to a plan, and that plan was uh, to watch one episode of Star Trek a day, uh, starting with uh, um, The Man Trap on January the 1st and my uh, spreadsheet of Eternal Doom uh, told me that if I carried on doing that, I would be watching the last episode of Enterprise on Christmas Day 2023. Wow. Uh, so that's what I did. And if you don't believe me, I have a book to prove it. <laughs> so... How much Star Trek did you know going into this? Just out of curiosity, because that's a big first yeah. contact day. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the, mo the movies count as one episode, uh, and uh, and double length episodes, which were shown uh, in their entirety when they were first shown, count as one too. Uh, so, how much Star Trek? I don't know. Well, um, uh, I'd always been into science fiction. I was big, a big Doctor Who guy, um, oh. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, Star Wars, not as much, but yes, you know, have seen it all. Uh, and so uh, I'm of the age when I was a teenager when The Next Generation was on the air. I say on the air, I first encountered The Next Generation uh, by renting VHS tapes. Uh, because wow. for about two years, that was the only way we could get access to Next Generation episodes in the UK. And they released uh, a, a, a tape with two episodes on it about once a month. So progress was slow to begin with. And then eventually, uh, uh, after about 1989, 1990, uh, BBC Two bought the first three seasons uh, and started showing them weekly. And then I could actually kind of get into it. Um, so uh, I had only watched a handful of original series episodes. I'd watched all the movies, but I'd only seen a handful of original series episodes when I was much younger, when I was like 
nine, I had uh, some of the books by James Blish. I don't know if you guys remember any of these. So these were uh, compilations. There'd be about five or six short story length versions of mm -hmm. classic episodes in each volume. And I just like picked a couple up at random from secondhand bookshops and asked my parents if I could have them, along with books by people like Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke or Robert Heinlein or things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And weirdly, uh, I, I must have read them and reread them. I don't have them anymore. I don't know what's happened to them, but I must have read them and reread them because watching some of those episodes of the original series, I found some of the prose coming back into my mind. And in some cases, <laughs> uh, the acting of the, the leads was so good that it elevated the episode and it was much richer and more powerful than it was on the page. And on other occasions, budgetary limitations which yeah. were a, a very real fact of making the series, but not a problem for the short story version, uh, made the actual television version somewhat of a disappointment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of those early episodes, especially on the first series, like some of those backgrounds and stuff are like, oof, that's kind of rough. You know? I think it drove but... me crazy was uh, uh, thinking, this planet must have a lot of suns, mm -hmm. judging by all the shadows that everybody is casting. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of stuff I pay attention to that bothers me. <laughs> oh, nothing drives me nuts yeah. more than a show where, especially on like cop shows and stuff now, Castle was horrible about it. Where, like, when we're sitting this way in the car, you know, like I'm looking at Ryan, the blue backlights are on this side of our head. But when the camera turns and he's looking at me, now all of a sudden they're all on the other side. <laughs> drives me up the freaking wall. I'm like, can't everybody else see <laughs> but nobody yes. else cares yeah i was gonna say oh i kind of like the castle no i'm just kidding i <laughs> <laughs> love the show i hate the lighting it drives me up the wall but yeah no it's like just even hearing that just like the progression of being slow how it was like renting out vh to wow. tapes so i guess i can say this is being funny not really but you know it's like there were no blockbusters there to be able to get all of the different like i think that's only an american chain right blockbuster was no no we had blockbuster here yeah no blockbuster, was, really? blockbuster was everywhere when, oh, when yeah. blockbuster was a thing oh yeah yeah they were the global they wouldn't, giant they wouldn't pass that up yeah absolutely but uh, it but, reminds uh, me a lot of trying to watch anime as a kid because like you could only really watch it if some obscure station was airing something you know like gotcha man reruns or if you found a video store in your town that happened to carry some and not, you know, think that it was all, you know, creepy, nasty adults only stuff. Yeah. And it's like trying to find a little mom and pop video shop that carried Japanese cartoons. That was tough. And then people yeah. are like, well, didn't you watch X, Y, Z? And like, dude, you couldn't find it in my town. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, but you'll notice I said that uh, BBC Two bought the first three seasons mm -hmm. of Next Generation. I don't know if that tickles anything in your brain uh, about where where that run of episodes might end. Not off the top of my head. To me, it's all one big long thing. So, <laughs> so uh, the third season is when it starts to get good. Uh, they bring in a new uh, head writer, Michael Pillar, who figures out how to use this ensemble of characters, and he also. Uh, he's agreed to come in and, and like do one year and, and sort the show out and make it work. Uh, and as a sort of parting gift to the writer's <laughs> room, uh, he leaves the series on a cliffhanger, which hadn't been done before. So this is the, the two-part story uh, called The Best of Both Worlds. Uh, oh. And at the end of Best of Both Worlds Part 1, uh, Picard has been captured by the Borg. Uh, his whole body's been transformed. He's now speaking for the Borg. He's like, uh, yes. And then... Locutus of Borg, exactly. And Riker <laughs> turns the Enterprise uh, to fire on the Borg ship, and the last thing we hear is fire to be, con co to be continued. Mm. Patrick Stewart says that uh, after they went off the air, he was driving through uh, Los Angeles traffic and stopped at a red light, and the family in the next car over uh, wound down the window and yelled at him, You have ruined our summer! <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, wow. either at Paramount or at the BBC, realised yeah. that if they only sold up to the end of Series 3, then they were going to leave British viewers <laughs> uh, in, in a very similar situation, but possibly forever. So, mm -hmm. miraculously, uh, it was Season 3, 
plus the best of both worlds part two. Oh, so we only had to awesome. wait a week. That's um, awesome. Not long after that, it was sold to Sky. It was sold to Rupert Murdoch's satellite TV company. And only about, I don't know what it was, like 20, 25% of UK homes even had a satellite dish. Uh, so that's a, so it was also hard for me then to keep up with Next Gen. And then I think Deep Space Nine must have been on Channel 4 or something. Or I had Sky by then, I can't remember. So I'd seen like bits and pieces of Deep Space Nine uh, and bits and pieces of Voyager. But I was, I was never really like following it closely. So... Uh, oh. TNG was the one I knew the best because uh, apart from anything else, I'd got the TNG Blu-rays about ten years ago when they came out. I I loved them all. I've basically loved every Star Trek that I've been exposed to so far. I've gotten a lot. Not me. Probably halfway through the new ones, I couldn't watch the new ones forever because they were locked away on the CBS website. Yeah. But now that I'm actually paying for it, finally I broke down. Yeah. I'm trying to catch up on them. But I've loved everything for one reason or another. Ryan, are you telling me, Ryan, we have a that you have a strong opinion about Star Trek? I can't believe that, Ryan. <laughs> I am floored. Are you what hard to your... please, Ryan, or do you just not like <laughs> any of it? No, I'm a Trekkie. I love Star Trek. I don't like modern Star Trek. I think it's absolute ah, modern. Okay. <laughs> modern Star Trek. Absolute? Is, it's absolute shit. It is garbage. Alex Kirkman. <laughs> All of it? He needs there's, a, there's a huge, huge variety there. He needs yeah, there's a lot there to all be garbage. <laughs> yeah. it's strong I dissenting. Discovery, I hate Discovery. Strange New Worlds has its moments, but it's also shit. So, like, Lower Decks? Know. Come lower on, decks dude, Lower Decks. Lower Decks I'm fun. telling you, Lower Decks <laughs> is what I've been wanting to see forever yeah, lower deck that is, is what i have always wanted to see and but, i freaking love it yeah i don't like modern star trek at all i think it's though i think i think when you're when you're the new producers coming in and taking over i think you've got to drive it like you stole it mm -hmm. i don't think you can afford to be too reverential you know uh in 1987 everybody knew that star trek was kirk and spock and without them it was never going to work mm -hmm. uh but uh, those producers uh, thought no we'll set it 80 years in the future we'll have a whole new cast and we'll make it work uh, and they found they found an audience so they'll I, i've no doubt there are people who still like ryan today say you know, I, I the only good star trek is 60 star trek and oh, all of the star trek is garbage uh, but, if it's not uh, cardboard sets it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not I, real I, I like all star trek it's, I, I like i even i like picard season three that season three is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, but, the card season three is the next generation season eight. Yeah, but I feel <laughs> like, like I don't know. There, there's a lot missing in new Star Trek from what you know. Star Trek has always been about, you know, just it's for me. It's just it's elevated. I feel like mm -hmm. new, like Star Trek is not is very desperate and like clinging on to like modern issues when star trek was never modern and that that's what bothers me about i mean trek. but they did deal with mod with current issues at the time you they know, did like, but it was it, they said it as like it's not a problem <laughs> like that's the yeah thing. it's well like normal. it's not a problem for us anymore <laughs> right but this crazy planet is still dealing yeah. with racism or I whatever like we gotta come fix it modern yeah. star trek has trouble with that like big time I don't know. I don't, I don't like it. I, at all. It's trash. The the one well, thing I cut that my me. I cut my journey off at the end of Enterprise, and that was not because well, it's partly because I didn't watch the J.J. Abrams movies. I think I feel about the J.J. Abrams movies the way Ryan feels about uh, Kurtzman Trek, uh, <laughs> but um, it was partly that, and it was also partly because I didn't want to uh, not be able to see things in their proper context. Uh, right, a show that finished in two thousand and five, let alone a show that finished in nineteen sixty nine. I can look back and see where it came from, where it ended up, what they were trying to do, what came after it. Uh, and I can't do that with any of the shows that are on the air at the moment. So that was apart from the, the oh, sheer yeah. neatness of the, of the, of the, the two-year span. Uh, That's why I love... to, to, to stop at Enterprise and then be able to look at that as a body of work. Yeah, that's why I love TNG and Deep Space Nine, because to me, they coexist hand in hand. Like, so, like, I don't know. It's just very difficult with this new track. I can't deal with it. The part that bothers me with New Trek is like, you know, with TNG and with uh, 
you know, Deep Space Nine and with Voyager and stuff, they either they jumped far in the future or then they went out and told stories in other places of that future, but they weren't going back and reinventing the past. Like, you know, yeah, they changed some things like the Klingons had the heads and stuff now from the movies that they didn't have in the old. And then they worked in stories to make that make sense. And that was fun. I enjoyed those parts. But I don't like it when they majorly reinvent stuff of the past, which is part of what kind of bothers me with the new shows, is they're going back and changing stuff with the Klingons and the Andorians, and they're just making everything a little bit different. And and like, if you took it another hundred years in the future and started from there, change it. Like, you know, planets change over time. Sure, I don't mind then, but you know, if we're going to go back and change the history that we've been loving all this time why it's all imaginary anyway we could jump another hundred years in the future and see what we're doing then as opposed to you know rehashing the same timeline that that's the part that bothers me going back and watching the early shows though it's fascinating to see that history be assembled and that they don't get it right the first time you know there's little things like um in where no man has gone before i think it is you see kirk's grave uh with the middle initial r because no one had decided what middle initial he should have yet uh, there's various goes at what the Federation is called before they end up with Federation in early episodes. Yeah. Kirk's reporting something, I think it's Space Central or something like that. Yeah. Uh, all these things take time. And the other things come up much later than you think. Uh, growing up with TNG, I'd assume that there's no money in the future uh, had been part of Star Trek since forever. But actually there's several occasions when Captain Kirk says things like, gentlemen, you've earned your pay for this week. Uh, I don't think it's until Star Trek Four that we get there's no money in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but like any of us that have worked on stories or stuff, like they're constantly evolving and changing. Yeah. And like in my series, the Mighty Caw, like he's got these scars on his arms that I put on there because they look awesome. And on a road trip last weekend, it just hit me with a really awesome idea, reason for why he has these that are now getting written into the story. It wasn't a part of the story before. They just look cool. Yeah. And now there's a reason for him, and I freaking love the reason for him, but it wasn't there like originally. You made an Easter egg for yourself, but just is like the gift that keeps on giving. It's just like, exactly. oh, perfect. I, I'm of like the Doctor Who mindset. I'm like, sprinkle lots of stuff in the background, and we'll make it make we'll make it be important later. And yes. then you can go back and watch those episodes and be like, oh, that's a Cyberman in the background. I didn't it's know. Fun. It's a I didn't know what I was going to do with that mask, but now I know what it is. And like. I love that stuff. It's a love, scatter love plot it. that just uh, like ends up becoming a tap tapestry at the end. It's just all connected somehow. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating difference between uh, writing a movie or a novel where you get to make all your changes before anyone sees it mm -hmm. and doing something serialized. Oh, yeah. Uh, where like, it's uh, got to get you're, out. Exactly. So. You're committed. Uh, and so sometimes you, you, have to, you have to just trust future you. And yeah. you, just, you just stick something in there today. <laughs> And you trust future you will make use of it or sort it out or make it make sense. Time uh, and, you know, Just future... trust yourself in the future. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sometimes future you is a genius. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes future you is like, past me? What the hell have you done? What am I supposed <laughs> to do with this? Why did you put us in here? We were rooting for you. We all were rooting for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Neil Gaiman says that uh, his goal when writing the second draft of anything... Neil Gaiman's proud of you're like, immortal. <laughs> yeah. He said uh, his goal when writing the second draft is to make it look as if everything he did in the first draft was intentional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would love, I would love to see that. Gaiman make a Star Trek movie. I, I would be sick. Oh, that, would be, that would be something. That would be brilliant. Yeah. Do you want to hear... Yeah, this, is, this is not about me or Star Trek or anything else, but it's a really good story. Do you want to hear a good Neil Gaiman story? Absolutely. Uh, this just came across my, uh, my I came across this just the other day. Uh, Neil Gaiman was asked about imposter syndrome. Mm. And he said, I think everybody suffers from imposter syndrome to a certain extent. I know that, that I do, uh, and I have done throughout my career, but it does tend to be a bigger problem early in your career. And I can remember early in my career, he said he was invited to this big event uh, and there were all these amazing people there talking. There were uh creators and artists and inventors and explorers and he didn't quite know why like, he a comics writer had been invited what he was doing there but he was chatting to someone else found someone to talk to they were chatting about various things including having the same first name 
Uh, and the other guy turned to him and confessed his imposter syndrome and said, I don't really know why I'm here because all these people have created all these amazing things and I just went where they told me to go. And Neil Gaiman said, yeah, but you did go to the moon. <laughs> I love that story. Oh, yeah. I love that one. That's but true. Everybody deals with it. Everybody. Yeah. Like, I haven't met anybody at a con or anything that doesn't deal with the same thing. And, like, you know, so true. I Every don't really know why people are lining up to get my signature, but if they want to, you know, I don't want to disappoint them. I was telling some of my uh, friends, or sometimes, like, the last two shows I went to, I said, you know, I feel like I'm Jake Paul sometimes, and my imposter syndrome is Mike Tyson. <laughs> and people were like, wow. I said, yeah, <laughs> I'm terrified. That's pretty good. <laughs> it happens um, to all of us, which is cool. It's very nice and relatable to know. So, what were some of your favorite things that you picked up from Star Trek? Like, what were your same, some of your favorite parts of it? So, uh, watching the original series, uh, which I was, like I said, probably the least familiar with, I guess what struck me quite early on is how good it is. Uh, and in some ways that was a surprise because I was sort of thinking, okay, maybe the first three months of this journey are going to be a bit of a slog. But mm -hmm. if things aren't really good when they start, they don't get the chance to develop into other things. Mm. Uh, so very often uh, what you get is, is good stuff at the beginning. Even the first season, I think the, the best run of episodes for me is the second half of the first season, you know, where they've, they've, they've figured out what they're doing uh, and they aren't completely just scrambling to get the show made. Uh, but that's a really, really strong run of episodes. And it was, in, it was actually on, on about December 28th or 29th, I can't remember now, just, just before I started officially, I watched The Cage. Uh, yeah. Pilot. Yeah. The cage. And uh, everyone always says, oh, it's, you know, it's, it, was, it was too good for TV. It was, it was so, so too, too cerebral that Americans wouldn't understand it. Too cerebral, too good for TV. And I know what they mean. But for me, it wasn't that it was cerebral, it was dealing with big concepts. Because like you were saying, Ryan, lots of these episodes deal with really big concepts. It's that the crew didn't look like they were having fun. Right. They didn't like each other. You know, when, when number one and the others are sitting around trying to figure out what they're going to do to try and get Pike back, they look like they're solving a Sudoku. Uh, there's no passion there. There's no... Oh, uh, Definitely God, no camaraderie. Definitely. No, no camaraderie at all. So then, as soon as you watch William Shatner, who comes in for a lot of stick, some of it deserved, but as soon as I watch William Shatner, it was immediately apparent to me, firstly, that Captain Kirk likes being captain of the Enterprise, which oh, is a yeah. big change from Pike. <laughs> but even more importantly, William Shatner loves being Captain Kirk. And that's so infectious. Yeah. Uh, but then very quickly, you get these really unexpectedly details character beats, particularly between Kirk and Spock. And there's really, really good stuff there. Amazing bit in uh, Devil in the Dark, where Spock is subtly undermining Kirk's authority and saying to the other like security details, uh, maybe just try and catch the creature because it's the last of its kind, you know, we'd like to study it. And Kirk said, no, the orders were shoot to kill. And then 20 minutes later, when uh, the creature has Kirk cornered, it's Spock saying, Jim, kill it. Because his love for his friend mm -hmm. is greater than his scientific curiosity. Yeah. And this is on like 7 p.m. Uh, in 1967. <laughs> it's incredible, mm -hmm. but it's That's really, good. really good stuff. Uh, and they, they keep trying to find new versions of that. And sometimes they succeed and sometimes they don't. The, uh, talking again about Drive It Like You Stole It, the, the huge <laughs> thing that enabled next generation to pull away from its progenitor is captain is uh, patrick stewart uh who you cannot compare to kirk it's such a different oh, piece no. of casting it's such a different piece of yeah. characterization so straight away you're judging them by completely different metrics mm -hmm. and yeah of course you can have a favorite but that's, oh, yeah. that's, that, that, that's fine and people do but it's not like they tried to do another kirk and came mm -hmm. up empty they did something yeah. totally different uh, and that was that was ballsy that was that mm -hmm. was brave, but it paid off. Well, especially when you're taking a franchise that was so beloved and cherished at this point, you know, it's a cult classic 
then and then to say, and yeah, we're going to redo on. this. They were still making movies when, when Next yeah. Generation started. We're going to redo this, but, you know, what we're not going to try and redo, we're not going to try and capture lightning in a bottle again that way. We're going to make our own thing. And the fact that they made it, like, a little more military and people, like, really behaved more like you would on a ship and the captain isn't just going off on every away mission and stuff because yes. captains wouldn't do that because it's stupid and it's dangerous to put your <laughs> commander out there on the, you know, Adam, you know what, that, buddy, me and you, we're going to go take this on ourselves. No, you send the ensign to go do that. That's why they got the red shirts. You send them out to die. Like, you know, I I loved it. They changed so much, but they made it so cool. And, yeah. you know, and it was... For me, one of the things I love is getting to see that the Federation has grown over that time. Even though it's different story writers, it's different show leaders and stuff like the you know, the Federation has grown and they've evolved and they've you know, it's not just a bunch of cowboys on ships exploring now, you know, like they're doing this systematically and, and this is their career and you know, and just I love it. I love it. Yeah. I love it. It I feels like a on. like a like a, a real universe. And Deep Space Nine is probably the apotheosis of that, where it becomes this great, big, complicated political situation with all these shifting alliances and trying to bring the Romulans oh, into the war right. and all that. that stuff is, yeah, that's fantastic. And people either love it or hate it. Like, there doesn't <laughs> seem to be a lot of middle ground on Deep Space Nine. Uh, yeah, Deep Space Nine is that you're either going to like it or, or you don't. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, really the, the weird like thing it. about Deep Space Nine, and I, I can only assume this was deliberate, is it's simultaneously the darkest, grimmest, yeah. grimiest Grim franchise, uh, but yeah. it's also the goofiest. Mm. Uh, you know, you have all those like cross-dressing Ferengi episodes and uh, uh, take me out to the Hollow Suite uh, and all this other just kind of <laughs> just, oh, bada bing, bada boom. I mean, come on, but that's yeah, basically some... that's basically forty-five minutes of people playing an escape room. Yeah, uh, made of light. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They <laughs> get away with it. They had a lot of holotech episodes, though. They had a lot of holotech episodes. Yeah. yeah, I. It's one of my favorites because of the way it lets you delve into all these different alien races and really find out more about them and yeah. understand how the civilizations work and and how oh, like. Sure. Getting to see the Ferengi is more than just you know like three or four guys you know yelling about profit and shooting at yep. you but to be yeah. like you really get to see them running a bar and fighting amongst each other and stealing from each other and you know brother against brother and who's going to get to be the grand negus and all this stuff like i freaking love that i geek out so much over like getting to find out more about these different planets and races and and how their civilizations work and stuff that's the juicy stuff for me so that's that's what I loved about Deep Space Nine. I mean, some people might call it like Truck Stop Nine and stuff, but I love the <laughs> fact that you really got a chance to find out more about, you know, the Bajorans and the Kardashians and all, all, all of these different things and not just, you know, they're not just surface bad guys, you know, but you really get to find out more about them and stuff. And I... I Oh, I do think it's weird stuff. though that, uh, and this isn't, this is just like the way these things happen, uh, but it is a bit weird that the series about the characters hanging out in a shopping mall in space is the one which is all about uh, generational trauma and the horrors of war, uh, mm -hmm. and the one which is about our characters flung over to the other side of the galaxy, clinging on to the only ship they've got in desperate <laughs> hopes of one day getting home, is the completely bonkers time travel, uh, loopy clone nonsense episodes, uh, which uh, then has to be also be the standard bearer for Star Trek's optimism about the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of the wrong way around. Oh, yeah. It's it's so wild. I mean, like, there, this truck stop at the end of nowhere, that would have been a good place to, like, be struggling with holding on to your ideals when you're so far out there. But then Voyager's so far out there. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, Voyager. Oh. Voyager is its own, its own base. It's its own land. Yeah, yeah. Like and, Janeway, like I love Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine is one of my favorite fleshed out characters. It's amazing what happens to that show when Seven of Nine turns up. Yeah, Seven it's, of Nine. It's is really kind of that the whole franchise is starting to feel tired. Yeah. Uh, and then she turns up, and it's just like this bolt of lightning goes through the show. Thing. One yeah. sexy woman in a bodysuit, and boom, everything. Just, it's crazy. <laughs> how that works. Yeah, it's like it's Gary good. Ryan. Gary Ryan had 
way she played seven and nine, she, she like she felt like just Borg half the time, but had a sense of humanity, which like this undertone of humanity beneath her, and it was just brilliant the way she did it. You know, even and watching in, that like, humanity evolve over the years, yeah. I, mean, I love it. Oh, even in Picard, it's like it. I was oh. like, oh. Oh, she's Love back. Her. Give her her own show, like, now. Green light that shit. Like, <laughs> I would watch that show. Yeah, I would watch <laughs> it immediately. Because, like, that, that's the thing about good Star Trek. Like, <laughs> characters <laughs> live with you. Like, they live mm-hmm. with you. I can't relate to Burnham or all these new people or new Spock <laughs> and new Kirk. And, like, I, I can't do it. New Pike. I, I can't. No. No. Yeah, I mean, even Neelix in that show, like yeah. I hate, I hate comic relief characters. But Neelix I hate Scrappy Doo. I hate Jabber <laughs> Jaws. I I hate all of the comic relief characters except for like Scooby and freaking Captain Caveman. Or er, I hate every other one. They drive me up the freaking wall. I hate Orko from He Man. I hate them all. Yep. But and Neelix drove me nuts in the beginning. Because I don't need a goofy furry little, you know, oh, Captain, get the can I help you out? But he grew into such an interesting character. And seeing him, you know, trying to find his place, trying to help the crew, trying to prove that he was important, trying to make a space for himself among mm-hmm. this crew of aliens, to mm-hmm. being hyper over protective over his girlfriend, to, you know, having to let her go and be his own thing. Like, see the way he grew over time became one of my favorite characters and the doctor on that show absolutely hated him in the beginning and he becomes the deepest richest kindest beautiful character (laughs) and and explored all kinds of interesting stuff beyond what they could even explore with data in the next generation like oh i freaking loved it i was a different it was a different way of making tv so when you're doing like 24, 25, 26 episodes a year mm-hmm. over nine months, it's a lot of episodes. And that has mm-hmm. benefits and drawbacks. One obvious drawback is they can't all be nine and 10 out of 10. Uh, mm-hmm. There are going to be some stinkers in there. And you just have to hope that, kind of as you're saying, Ryan, you know, your, your affection for the characters and the cast is just going to carry yeah, you yeah. through the, the dull yeah. ones. <laughs> but the benefit, like the, the benefit that I think the, the writers get is over the, the 10 or 11 months it takes to make a series, mm-hmm. the writers get to see what the actors are capable of. The actors start to understand mm-hmm. what the writers are doing. And you, on a good day, when, you know, when everything clicks, uh, then you get this alchemy. And I think, that, I think Neelix is a really, really good example of that. Uh, because there's no one who like, comes in and goes, I'm going to solve Neelix. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that Ron Moore came in and went, I'm going to find out who Klingons are. Uh, and I think who was it? Who, who was the Ferengi guy on Deep Space Nine? Was it Ira, was it Ira Bear? Somebody came uh, in at some point and said it's the same dude who was in Buffy. He played the principal. I know you're not. No, 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 no. I mean, who was who was the writer who came in and oh, went, uh, I'm going to do? Yeah, no, Armin Shimmerman is a genius actor. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so, so uh, with Neelix, it's just this like slow evolution. You're right. He mm-hmm. comes in with this just comic relief. And then they just give him a little something to do here, and Ethan Phillips rises to the occasion, and then another writer will watch that and go, oh, well, maybe I can give him this to do. And he gradually kind of accretes material. So the benefit you get from being able to plan out just a 10-part series uh, is there should be no excuse for weak episodes because you plan everything out to all hang together and all tell one big story. So you're not going to have the episode that you don't like focus on the character you're not interested in this week because it's all part of one big story. But on the other hand, you're going to have everything in the... Oh. <laughs> you cut out for a second there. Are you there? No. No. We're losing him. <laughs> We're losing him, Captain. I'm Get giving it all the calls. Come in. Come in. AG. I cannot change the laws of physics. Change the laws of physics, bitch. <laughs> Am I back? Yes. You're back. yes, you're back now. Yeah. Well, I won't repeat what I just said, and you will never know how that... Uh... <laughs> it's in the pattern buffers. It'll be fine. We'll get it out. We'll yes. run it through the holodeck later. It'll be fine. Yeah, put it through the holodeck, fish. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Uh, yeah, so it is, it is interesting looking at uh, how television was made in the 60s, how television was made in mainly the 90s, and how television is being made now. And it's, it's, it is three 
quite different versions of the same thing. But I think we also forget how much closer to the original series. Mm -hmm. you know, the original series finished in 69. The next generation started in 87. It's less than 20 years. Uh, and uh, now uh, from 87 to now, <laughs> that's that's like 35 years. Yeah, that's a stretch right there. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that's, I was like, that is a big because it felt <laughs> yeah. like forever. It kind of dawned on me, like, wow, when I was a teenager. Generation, like fish since the eighties, like yeah, it's been around for each generation. It's, so it is wow. nuts. That is that's why we have all the new people who love Discovery. I'm just like, I hate you mm -hmm. all. Like. Mm. <laughs> I'm not gonna hate anybody for liking something different than me, but Stop like it, I Stop it. I like it, but it's not <laughs> it doesn't hit for me quite the same way as some of the other ones did, but they also hit at different points in my life. Like well, I used to watch the reruns of the original series with my dad when he got home off of work. And mm -hmm. I we would then we started watching the next generation together when it came out. And then like when Voyager and stuff hit that was my show that I watched with my buddy and we hung out after college and go over to his house and would, you know, make dinner. And we first time I ate a steak was actually the night they episode that they aired the first episode of Voyager. And he was so excited because he was a super Trekkie. And that was the first time I had a steak and enjoyed it. And I will <laughs> never forget that as long as I live. Uh, so, did you enjoy the steak more or Star Trek more? They were both really good and both really surprised. <laughs> so maybe, like you said, there was that alchemy between like the actors and writer. Apparently, the steak and the show were working simultaneously mm. at the same. It time. It turns yeah. out if you don't cook it till it's gray shoe leather, they're actually pretty tasty. Who knew? I did not know that. My dad, boy, he cooked them things till they were jerky, and you had to <laughs> sit there at that table until it was done. I always knew I get to stay up late that night. Because I would be there at 11 o'clock at night still trying to chew my way through that thing. <laughs> and, oh, I hated it. I, I don't know why people do this for fun. I mean, honestly, like, Fish, apparently, if you shaved that beard, apparently we would see the jawline made of chisel from God's then, if you say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then all of a sudden I found out, oh, it could be juicy and delicious. And, no, oh, it's a whole different thing now. now Change your whole world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Change my whole world, added 100 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, so Ryan, what is your favorite thing about Star Star Trek while we're talking about it? Just, you know, the differences, cultures and races of aliens, like from Cleons to Romulans to Vulcans to Ferengi. Like I, I that's a, like Deep Space Nine is my my bread and butter. Like that's my like Cisco's is my Cisco's my favorite captain. Like, I love the animosity he has towards Picard, but there's a mutual respect, you know, like, because he hates Picard because there's reasons. Um, so watch TNG. <laughs> watch TNG for that. Um, but I, I think for me, like, th this is when I say, like, that's what I feel like Star Trek is missing today is, like, the relationship is not as important anymore. Like, they're just mm. not. There's a lot of stuff that's missing. It's more like we have to have the action. We have to keep people engaged. It's like a TikTok. Like, you get. We got to have the special effects. And have all the special that stuff. effects. You have that. Like, Star Trek didn't have that shit back in the day. That you have people in plastic costumes dressing up mm -hmm. as aliens, beating the shit out of each other, and wrestling on the ground. And you believe that. <laughs> like, you believe that. Shit. Yeah. Paper rocks and throwing them yeah. each other. Yeah, Hitting each other with today, fists together. Yeah, today you have to have light <laughs> light players and there's the screen and everything has to be bright and technologically like just I don't know, it's just not good to me. Like you didn't need to have all these things to have a good episode of T V. Yeah, Even yeah. TNG was not always good. Though they buffed up the computer animations over the years to the DVD box sets and the Blu-ray sets. If you watch the original But it's thing, still a lot of people just like yelling garbage. into the air. It was still garbage. While they talk about what's happening right. rather than seeing it happen because it was right. too expensive to show it happening. Yeah, so let's and, talk about it. 
Yeah, so that's like, one of the things I love about the limitations in any medium. The limitations push your creativity to come up with something cool. And like a lot of the cool spaceships and stuff we have are because we were scrounging for things out of junk and came up with something really cool out of it. Or a lot of the cool things like like the transporters wouldn't exist if it was cheaper to show them landing the ship right. on the planet every time. But that's too expensive. So let's come up with something cheaper. And the freaking teleporters are awesome and have led to all kinds of cool storylines and story yeah. arcs. And Scotty putting himself in the buffer for, you know, decades to <laughs> yes. save his Thank life you. and stuff. That, it Thank leads you. me to so many questions about, like, why aren't we just spitting out clones of people out of that thing, you know, to send in like, <laughs> right. like, My you know. favorite dynamic and my favorite relationship was Rikert and Picard. Like, their dynamic is so like it's it, it's irresistible like if you put them two on television they're captivating they're literally mm -hmm. captivating like because Rikert is such the polar opposite of Picard but yet they just gel so well like you can see the seeds of like the next yeah. Kirk in him yeah like, he could totally be the next Kirk if yeah. it wasn't for the training and tutelage he's getting from Picard and yep. you know, he's going to make him something better than just that. And I let, and this is, what we don't, this is what we don't have in modern Star Trek. I was going to say, and I think to your fun. point, it's the you. imagination. Like it, you didn't need all the special effects and everything like that. Cause you didn't even saw the you shot. It's it just, just was like writing. The writing yeah. is just not good. I don't find the writing to be good if this is i i can't i can try to like light and he's just like no no <laughs> like I mean, oh. if you watch picard oh. if you watch the first two seasons of picard absolutely hot shit it is unbelievably bad but then when you get to season three you're like why wasn't this showrunner here from the start like <laughs> You just had to let them cook. That's all, you know. I you am not cooking. Them. It's just find better writers. <laughs> just let them cook. They had to. You find try your best, right? Writers. You just had to let them yeah. cook. You had to test the process, you know. <laughs> Nobody goes in and says, "You know what? This guy sucks, but he's cheap, so we're going to hire him." <laughs> Nobody goes in saying, "Everybody's like, you know, hey, this, I think this dude's going to do a good job." Mm -hmm. Oh, and he did not do a good job. Let's find somebody else. Like, it, yeah, and like it, 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 like I said, it, it took better part of three years to find writers who got Star Trek Next Generation and understood how to how to make it work. But there was such an appetite for more Star Trek. And we were starting to get to know the characters because we had 26 episodes a year with them mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, Paramount just kept rolling the dice again, rolling the dice again, until suddenly you're watching shows like Best of Both Worlds and everything's, everything's clicking. Uh, but because yeah, Roddenberry um, made life well, Roddenberry and then Rick Berman made life hard for the writers because this isn't really true of the original series, but it became a, like a rule in the writers' room for Next Generation that the Starfleet officers couldn't have any conflict with each other. Now, normally, if you're designing a show mm -hmm. and you're looking at characters, you try to find characters that, that will rub up against each other in interesting ways and will have differences of opinion and will create that. Well, conflict. Bones was like straight exactly. up racist to it's, Spock yeah, all yeah. the time. Every like, episode. Yeah. yeah. But the next gen, uh, Roddenberry got into his head that this, this was his utopia. That's what made Star Trek different from all these other dystopian shows. And there's going to be no conflict. And the writers were tearing their hair That's out. Like, how do we make stories happen? So there are so many not very interesting uh, uh, episodes in the first two seasons where the Enterprise turns up at some planet and the Zagbars are fighting the Zoobles and Picard says, listen, why don't you not? And they go, what a brilliant idea. Why didn't we think of that in 10 generations? Uh, and then the Enterprise leaves, everybody happy. Uh, but it's the little details of the characterization that start to really pay off. There's an episode, I think it's, uh, I think it's Gambit, where uh, Picard's pretending to be a pirate for reasons. Uh, and, and Riker's also been uh, been kidnapped, and so everyone's had to like move up one. So Data is in command, and Worf questions his authority on the bridge. And Data calls him into his ready room, and says, "If you're not able to follow my orders, I'm going to have to replace you." And Worf says, "I'm terribly sorry. I don't know what I was thinking." And Data says, 
I hope this won't affect our friendship. <laughs> so all the, the, the conflict fizzles away, but there's been so little conflict up till now, it feels seismic. It's such a big it's like deal. I've, yeah. I've walked in on, on my parents arguing for the first time. Like I've heard my dad swear. Like, and what's how does Worf here? not have a bone to pick with everybody? <laughs> yes. like, like, how does like, the only yeah. cling on in the room? It's kind of amazing. Worf will be the first one to go off because he's a clean yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ever seen. But I also I get, get it because that's what they've always expected of him. So like mm -hmm. I get I get it, but also like I I love seeing his temper. I love seeing yeah. it when he's struggling to control himself. Oh, he's a badass he's hard season three. He's a badass. <laughs> uh, yeah, so these are all the uh, the various discoveries that I made. Uh, there's a lot of material. So uh, my journey, uh, I was just, I think I was saying this just before we uh, came on air. Uh, it was going to be two books, uh, but turns out uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, Voyager and Enterprise put out a lot of episodes. Yes. Uh, so it's going to be three books. Woo! Uh, <laughs> but the, the first book covers... Uh, the original series, the animated series, which we can talk about if you'd like. <laughs> oh. uh, the the original series, movies, and the next generation, uh, and uh -oh. then book two will pick up with Deep Space Nine. I watch everything in strict release order, so I was Ooh. watching Deep Space Nine episodes interleaved with Next Gen episodes, and then Voyager Ooh. episodes interleaved with oh. Deep Space Nine. Oh man! I, nice. Now I want to do that. Now I really want to do that. <laughs> And, and you, can, you can see the shows, even with each other, like the, 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 the Marquis is an idea that gets set up in a TNG episode, and then that becomes a big feature of Deep Space Nine, and that becomes the premise of Voyager, and you see these ideas just sort of flitting around from series to series, and from showrunner to showrunner. <laughs> it's a lead. Love it. <laughs> and, and actually, the animated they're series gets to do some cool all, stuff, too. They're literally all connected. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, getting to see Spock later on in real life tell the story about his pet dying that I watched in the yeah. animated series. Like that was freaking awesome. And be oh, like, you know, so yes, it, I, I remember that. I was there. Yeah, I saw that. And the, that was... they have holodecks of the animated series, which I didn't know until I watched it. Oh, I don't remember that either. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. True say. That is cool. Oh, is I got to go back and watch that too. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm so, so excited. I'm ready to watch. just like get the biggest tub of popcorn that I can have and just right. really try to Sit there. You need like, to dive into it. You I, 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 I am. I am. Just dedicate two Our years track. like the man did. Dedicate two years. Okay. It's so rich and it's so good. Like it'll <laughs> suck you. The, it'll suck you in like that. Once you start it, you're like, I need to watch another episode. I think that's probably why I'm scared. I have commitment issues. And honestly, <laughs> I love the way he did that because, like, going in in airing order would mm. take you back and forth from one series to the other and like honestly i think just slogging through deep space nine by itself just one like binge it one episode after another would be pretty heavy like because it's yeah. it's pretty dark and gritty and gets to some tough places at times it's i wouldn't want to just go through that it's different but to be able to go between the next generation and then voyager and like get Get a, a palate cleanser in between yeah. some of those. I was about to say, I was like, wouldn't it kind of lighten stuff. it, lighten the load on the yeah, way? Yeah, exactly. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that would be, I would love to do that. I would love that because that's the way I saw it originally. Of course. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. oh, oh, I love that. God. Love so, that. is on the book, is the first book done now or are you? First book's working? done. Yeah, it'll be out uh, next week. Uh, so awesome. yeah, available available to buy now. You can get it from Amazon. You can get it from Barnes and Noble. Probably uh, any other bookstore near you would order it for you. It's called nice. Star Trek: Discovering the TV Series, uh, and yeah, that goes up to the end of Next Generation. Uh, and there are a few little guest reviews in there as well because you know this is a book uh, full of my great big important opinions. Uh, and <laughs> as we've learned, uh, opinions can be varied. Uh, yeah. So uh, I have a few guest reviews in there as well from notable friends or friends of friends. Uh, and sometimes they agree with me, and sometimes they don't. So um, 
if there's a favorite episode of, uh, of mine that you detest uh, or, or there's an episode that you loathe, which I unaccountably found good things to say about it, uh, <laughs> then rest assured, I'm not claiming that I have any particular knowledge. These are how these episodes struck me as I watched them. Uh, and that's all it is. But uh, hopefully I got some interesting things to say, some interesting ways to put things, some, some useful insights, a few bits of behind the scenes stuff that I gleaned. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fun time. I'm excited. I didn't know it was next week. I knew I saw the pre-order. So it was like, I remember putting that in the description. Make sure people definitely go to click it. But that was that's exciting yeah. to know. It's coming up very soon. Very soon. Yeah, that is awesome. I'm going to have to check that out. It yeah. is really surprising. Like some of the books that I have found incredibly interesting. Like I just bumped into a guy at a con one time who is a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I can't remember. But uh, he did a series of books on like the psychology of Batman and the psychology of Superman and stuff. And my son bought it because he's like, oh, dad, you love Batman. It's a really interesting book and like mm -hmm. delves into like what the real life psychology is of somebody that, you know, is going through all this stuff and living with this. And it was, it was interesting stuff. And as a big Star Trek fan, I, I got to check out your thoughts on the series. That's just that's cool stuff. Um. Ryan, do you have any any questions, any bones you want to pick about Star Trek with our guest here? I mean, like, I, I, I love Trek. It's been my thing. I don't know. I, I just feel like I feel like your book's important. I'm really excited about it. Um, again, also hear your opinions on episodes. Right. Um, so that should be interesting. Um, Fee, you need to start watching star trek thank you I, I, thought, I told you he was gonna do that i told you you got a guide thought, you can I buy thought I was scared <laughs> because I told you, you felt yeah. it too didn't you <laughs> but so that, I, that's, oh that's one thing i'm going to say mm -hmm. you need to watch star trek yeah you've been owed star trek um how did you feel about star trek the motion picture because a lot of people don't like mm -hmm. the motion picture i personally mm -hmm. like it but a lot of people don't like the motion picture. It, it's a bit of an, an, an odd duck. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, it, you can sort of tell it's been hammered together from bits and pieces that were intended for a TV series. Yep. And the bits don't always gel. Uh, so like the first half is really super concerned with the relationship between Kirk and Decker. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as uh, Ilea is, is killed and replaced by a probe, all of that Kirk and Decker stuff just goes away. Yep. It hasn't been resolved. It hasn't built to anything. It hasn't got us anywhere. It just stops. And then for about 45 minutes, uh, everyone on board tries to find out if Ilea is still inside the probe or not, which is a fair enough thing for them to try and do, but that doesn't go anywhere either. It's just a thing to keep them occupied. And then eventually they discover that, spoiler for a 1979 movie, uh, that, uh, that Vija <laughs> is Voyager. Uh, and, uh, and then the ending is actually pretty good. What I think is really interesting is that the one character who does have quite a good arc through that movie is Spock. Uh, mm -hmm. And looking behind the scenes, I think that's because Spock almost wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. They had a script basically ready to go. And uh, virtually you know, weeks before filming started, I think it was Robert Wise's daughter said, but daddy, you can't have a Star Trek movie without Spock in it. And they had one more go at getting Leonard Nimoy to sign on. And this time they were successful. So then somebody had to sit down and think, oh, God, what is Spock's journey through this film? But Spock's the only character for which that question has been asked and answered. Yeah, uh, everybody believe... else has, has stuff to do because there were all these bits and pieces of scripts knocking around from Star Trek Phase 2 that have been yeah. hammered together. But no one sat down and gone, well, hang on a minute. Where do we, where do we meet Kirk and where does he end up? Uh, let alone, you know, God help us, Scotty or, or Uhura or even Bones. Uh, it's just giving them <laughs> stuff to do. But Spock has an arc. And particularly in the recently released director's cut where some Spock material that was cut has been reinstated. I think that is very effective. And his sort of discovering his humanity in the machine creature is really affecting. Yeah, it's uh, but uh, it's, it, is, it is still kind of a mess. It is a yeah, mess. I haven't rewatched that. Decker, Decker, that whole thing was supposed to spin off into a new show. Yeah, like yeah with, tell, with Chapner in, in, in like every film. You like it was all yeah. like, you couldn't tell if this was a movie or a show. Yeah. Like it was really So it was kind of like the, the Frankenstein of past 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because what, like, what's amazing they, have is- moments, they have moments where it felt like you're watching Doom. Like, everything was just focused on special effects here and there. <laughs> and then, like, like, and then it was, like, a mesh hodgepodge of, like, is this a show or a movie? Like, the tension was really weird. Like, scripts, are, it was just rough. It's, it's like weird. What's amazing is that, uh, is that Wrath of Khan was kind of written in the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were all these scripts knocking around uh, that nobody really liked, and Nicholas Meyer had come on board as director, but there wasn't a script that anyone was going to sign off on. So he said, okay, tell me all the things you like in these, like, ten scripts. Mm-hmm. And if there's enough material there, I'll try and turn that into one script. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the producer, Harv Bennett, looks at him and went, uh, I mean, you can try, but we start shooting in two weeks. And Nicholas Meyer was young and stupid, and he said, I think I could do this in two weeks. And Harv Bennett said, Nick, we couldn't do your deal in two weeks. So the reason that he doesn't have a screenplay credit for Star Trek Two is that he didn't have a deal. He just wrote it, uh, trusting that the studio would look after him. And uh, he had the sense... Star Trek movies ever. Because he had the sense to start with who is Captain Kirk and where, he, where is he in his life and use a lot of the other science fiction stuff about Genesis and oh Khan from Space God. Seed and so on to shine a light on who this guy is. Wow. And that's what makes that such a good film. And, and uh, apart from the Fee, you know, start with that, that, nasty, that nasty little ending. Yeah, no spoilers for Fee. <laughs> I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll be okay. I promise. I'm all right. <laughs> That's insane. Man, I totally forgot about the first movie. I oh. totally just like <laughs> that out of my mind. Well, they kind of ignored it, you know. T- two, I have two, a personal three, feeling. Two, I have four a are... to it. Like I'm okay with it, but a <laughs> lot of people hate Star Trek: The Motion Picture. I've them. I've watched all the other movies several times. The one where they come back the to save the whale. whales was my favorite at the time. I got in Ooh. so much trouble because with the whale. one of the one of the Star Trek magazines that I bought because I loved the movie so much had a 900 phone line where you could call and hear messages from the cast. You know, like O'Hara giving you know calls and you know Scotty replying and whatnot. I racked up like 150 bucks on that phone line <laughs> in 80 whatever. Were you, were you the bill payer? Thing. I don't think you were the bill payer. Oh, I ended up being the bill payer because I had to work all that off. I mowed so many freaking yards for like 10 bucks a pop. Fish, you could have contributed that to the exit. Oh, man, let's not talk about that. And you must know yeah, the behind the scenes story about the voyage home. About the the suggested guest star. Uh, so in this would have been eighty six, I think. Uh, they were thinking we're going to do this new Star Trek film. We're going to take the crew back in time to nineteen eighty San Francisco. Be great mm-hmm. to get a really good guest star in there. And they offered the job to Eddie Murphy. Oh wow! Wow. So this is only a few years after Richard Pryor had done uh, Superman 3. So you can maybe like see where their head was at. But they offered it to him and all he had to do was say yes. And we would be talking about now Star Trek 4, the one with with Eddie Murphy in it. Um, But not the whales. He did the golden child instead. Uh, Good choice. Good choice. (laughs) What about the balancing of scales? What in the world was Uh, happening behind the scenes with that? That's crazy. What are the odds? That's insane. (laughs) Go pick up this book, everyone. Go pre-order it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The Absolutely. link is in the description. Make sure you click that. As well as just follow him on all social medias. Has a lot of cool things. Obviously has almost said Twitter, you know, X, Instagram, all those. Make sure you follow and support. And all the other wonderful things that he is doing. He is doing a lot of great things. I saw that spontaneity out there. I was like, that's cool. But of course, that's all yeah. there too. Thank you so much for having me, guys. It's been an absolute blast. Oh, absolutely. This was a fun conversation. Thank you all for coming and hanging out. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for a great conversation, Tom. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I could sit here and talk about this for the rest of the night, but I know other people got things to do. So we're going to roll the credits and be the best version of yourselves. Be five star, whatever it is. Tony says, I don't remember. I hear it every week and I can't remember it. 
But I love y'all. Have fun. Peace out. And we'll see y'all next Friday.